you have the floor. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here at Univention and in Bremen. It's the first time I'm in Bremen. Maybe you've noticed uh, from my uh, accent and my name, I'm, uh, um, I was born in the U.S., uh, but I uh, live in Europe by choice, so I'm not ba biased here. I would like to look at it, um, um, put it in a um, international geopolitical context. Let me start with a quote. Maybe you know this uh, community is well known. The uh, Decla Declaration of Independence of uh, Cyberspace of 1996. The industrialization uh, of uh, the world, you um, tired um, beings of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace um, as a representative of the future. I recommend to you of the past to leave us in peace. You're not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. And I think that this uh, shows the optimism and ideology of the beginning of the digital technology in the early 1990s, the age of the first age of the internet. However, we know that this ideology keeps being questioned. This um, question of antipathy um, uh, of um, state authority and monopolies, so um, states have monopolies and more and more companies have monopolies. Indeed, we are entering a uh, global connectivity crisis where controls of nodes um, are becoming of um, ever greater geopolitical um, significance. It's called weaponized interdependence. Uh, we can see it in the context of ecology and climate change. We cannot see it again now with Russia's uh, war against Ukraine um, in uh, the context of oil and gas and wheat as well, but also in um, financial terms uh, with uh, Brazil and China and Brazil uh, and the US but also uh, with the uh, control of capital movements. We can see in, in uh, trade productivity with uh, um, interruption of uh, supply chains. We can see it with the um, uh, productivity um, in um, the medical terms with um, vaccination availability, vaccine availabilities and mutations of COVID. We can see it with um, movements of people, with refugees from uh, Syria and other places, and Ukraine, for instance. And we see it with the market uh, power of online gatekeepers, um, the um, power of Nokia uh, and others. So sovereignty is back, as it were. Uh, if we say shift happens, this is the shift. We know that nobody, uh, uh, somebody who controls or how you control the internet is a very important uh, aspect. NATO defines this as strategic simultaneity, where we see that uh, several general purpose technologies are coming online uh, at the same time. In the past, we had generations to establish and digest uh, general purpose technologies, for instance, telegraphy, um, power, uh, uh, fire, etc. But now we have high performance computing, blockchain, biotechnology, everything at a time. Add to this the development of systemic competition between the US and China and the rise of digital uh, authoritarianism, where um, all sorts of companies uh, build digital capabilities in order to consolidate their power over citizens. That not only happens in the state sector, but also in the private sector with big tech. Um, and uh, with certain platforms, we can see an increase of uh, the frequency of cyber, cyber operations and this awareness of, um, in, uh, of dependencies and vulnerabilities 
is also being brought back to mind in the context of the war of Russia against Ukraine. States uh, try to counteract by regulation and by a renaissance of technical industrial policy. And this takes us to a situation where there will be a collapse, or at least um, there is a weakness in the international digital system and an increasing and digital mercantilism. And against this background, Europe is in the process of defining her um, digital sovereignty. We have uh, performed a survey of how Europeans uh, see their digital sovereignty in AI, uh, semiconductors, uh, network uh, computing equipment, uh, cloud computing, etc. And I'll only give you a few results of these studies. 76% of Europeans believe that Europe in cloud computing depends too much from external agents. 86% believe that the same goes for AI. And 54% for uh, believe the same for 5G. Europeans believe that in six of seven areas that we covered that Europe is too dependent on American suppliers. And if we ask where do you see Europe in a position of leadership or a peer position or a position of risk management in every single um, area of people thought that area, uh, Europe was in an um, area of risk management. Politicians tried to counteract this, recapturing digital sovereignty, but it's a very vague concept, of course, and what we can see, what I can, what I can see when I'm in uh, Brussels, in, uh, Brussels or in Paris, is the cohabitation of two traditions of digital sovereignty. One is an uh, auto-liberal um, definition of its rule base that you need uh, dynamic uh, competition, interoperability, uh, avoidance of lock-in effects, that you need uh, a lot of regulation and state intervention to keep markets open, that there should be open markets based on fundamental rights such as uh, informational self-determination and consumer rights. This type of um, digital sovereignty, there are different levels, individual uh, sovereignty, company sovereignty, state sovereignty. That's one thing. The other thing we can see in Europe is a kind of techno uh, um, uh, centration. Uh, uh, so that uh, in uh, Europe, a uh, tech uh, techno um, substitution industrialization has been uh, installed. And these two um, viewpoints uh, keep being negotiated in Brussels. You can see it reflected in Gaia X, the CHIPS Act of the uh, European Union and uh, the reliance of uh, processors on uh, imported uh, materials. Sometimes you can marry these two. Uh, position. Sometimes they are incompatible. And that is something we might discuss. The last point uh, that I would like to make is based on my survey as well. What should be uh, the geopolitical positioning of Europe in the technological confrontation between the US and China? How should Europe position itself? That's what we asked Europeans, and 46% said that Europe should um, approximate the US, and 54% uh, said that Europe should remain independent. So that is the biggest uh, geopolitical question that we can discuss here today. Uh, should there be a uh, uh, dichotomy, uh, a, a, a cooperation between Europe, uh, the US, and other like-minded uh, countries, or a third way for Europe. And I'm uh, looking forward to entering into a discussion with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tyson. And we can now talk about this topic, and Peter will join us, but first the two of us. So you just came back from Paris. That's true. 
So what did you do in Paris? Well, I said as there is a uh, G2, there will be G2 for um, democratic um, digital governance. And there is already a body that's being created, the Trade and Technology Council between the US and Europe, which has had its second meeting in Paris. Against the background of Russia's war against Ukraine, they have decided on a lot of things. But if you think uh, G2 or third way, this is definitely in the direction of G2. Well, the European Commission had the idea of setting up something similar with India, also against the background of the war against Ukraine, and also looking at the dependency of India versus Russia. What do you think of that? Well, two points in this context. First of all, the relationship between the US and Europe is a unique relationship that could be a systemic partnership. The relationship with India simply is not as well developed. Let me just give you an example. 55 percent, uh, there is 55 percent more data flows between the US and Europe via undersea uh, cables than uh, between the US and all of Asia. So this is really the uh, world's data cable, and we can see it everywhere, be it in uh, data governance, hardware, uh, etc. The relationship between the US and Europe is much more important than um, that with uh, India. However, what happened with uh, the uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine war, the disinformation campaign in the global uh, south, the Global South has become uh, increasingly important and it's not yet well uh, integrated and uh, taken into consideration of like-minded uh, states. That's a phrase you keep hearing. And if the idea of like-minded states is only uh, um, an acronym for the Global North, then we won't make good progress, I believe. My favorite topic, and I tell you, on the topic of like-minded states, the G7 states met in Germany, so we are currently having the presidency of G7, so the digital ministers met in Dusseldorf, and is that an institution where one could maybe achieve digital sovereignty in collaboration with countries like Canada, US, or Japan, so as a core group? Well, recently there's been a lot in this uh, context of uh, like-minded states, um, a meeting of the uh, digital ministers in Düsseldorf last week. Uh, there was also an announcement on the future of the Internet, also signed by the like-minded states, but not uh, by many from the Global South, including uh, South Korea and Mexico did not sign it. That's a warning sign for us. What I think is uh, Tom Wheeler, he's the former uh, CEO of the FCC, uh, he said digital capitalism always has to reflect the systems that it tries to regulate. And in an industrial age that was possible to achieve with regulation very statically, uh, rules-based, agreement-based, so it was very static institutions, and in this digital age we need more ecosystems, to use a buzzword, but uh, there will be uh, alliance ecosystems, so uh, huge alliances for the future of uh, the Internet will have to complement each other. Coming back to the transatlantic uh, relationship, how does the United States uh, view the uh, European ideas of European digital sovereignty? The perception in the US is a bit simplified, I'd say. Um, they think it's a short um, uh, for protectionism, and all they see is one idea of sovereignty, i.e. state sovereignty this Westphalian idea of sovereignty. And in so far in Europe, they see, and I disagree, but they see a similar trend uh, towards sovereignty as they, uh, you can see it in uh, East Asia, uh, mostly China, but not only, uh, i.e. trying to promote uh, domestic champions um, 
establishing them uh, via the size of the home market, and they're quite skeptical uh, towards that. Uh, we know in cloud, for instance, the hyperscaler is very dominant right now. And do they see us Europeans as an economic threat? I wouldn't call it a threat. I would, um, well, Europe is an important partner. And uh, these attempts of decoupling uh, that they see uh, in this um, interpretation of uh, digital sovereignty, they uh, lose a partner in governance and business.